The Nintendo Game Boy was released in 1989 and compared to its competition it was severely underpowered. With a measly 4MHz 8-bit CPU, 8KB of RAM, 8KB of graphics RAM, 4 colors, basic 4-channel sound serial link-up and a small dot matrix display, on paper it should have only really been designed for simple games. And for a while, that was actually true, with Tetris being the standout. Simple but addictive, and it helped sell millions of Game Boys. But the Game Boy has quite a lot of power underneath the hood, despite being based on older technology. This was a deliberate move to keep the cost low. However, Nintendo designed the Game Boy to be capable and flexible enough for it to do some amazing things. With hardware features such as separate sprite, background and window layers, and mid-frame scanline manipulations, amongst other things. And with the right optimizations, almost anything was possible. Dylan Cuthbert, who worked for Argonaut Software, and later the lead programmer for Star Fox on the Super NES, developed a game known as Zakisu on the Game Boy that ran 3D vector graphics at impressive speeds for just an 8-bit 4MHz processor. But one thing that just wasn't possible was getting more colors from the hardware. The original Game Boy just had four colors, and although programmers made clever use of dithering techniques to simulate more shades of green, there was really no other option here with just two bits for the color palette. In 1998, reportedly after pressure from developers to release a more sophisticated handheld, Nintendo released the Game Boy Color, the first handheld to be fully backward compatible with the original Game Boy. So it's been 10 years after the launch of the original Game Boy when the Game Boy Color was released. Now, Nintendo essentially took the same exact architecture of the Game Boy and just brought it forward with the Game Boy Color, but added some crucial additions that really helped propel the Game Boy Color to the next level, but not losing sight of what made the Game Boy so amazing. The Game Boy Color is almost the exact same hardware as the original Game Boy, but utilizes a 15-bit color palette or a palette of over 32,000 colors to pick from instead of just four. But there are some more differences that we'll get into. If we think about any retro console or home computer from around the same era as the Game Boy Color, consider what it would take to introduce or increase the color palette. The changes would be significant. For example, the increase of colors on a PC from EGA, which was 16 colors, to VGA, which was 256, required a fairly substantial upgrade to the PC. The Commodore Amiga 500, which most games would run at either 16 or 32 colors from a palette of 4096, and when the Amiga was upgraded with AGA, or the Advanced Graphics Architecture chipset, the standard was 256 colors from a palette of 16 million but the entire custom chip architecture was redesigned for this change. With the Game Boy Color, Nintendo took the exact same architecture, took the CPU, doubled its clock speed and offered two modes, 4 MHz and 8 MHz. It also came with 32 kilobytes of RAM instead of 8 kilobytes, and doubled the graphics RAM from 8 kilobytes to 16 kilobytes. Aside from this, it has the exact same sound device and the exact same screen resolution at 160 by 144 pixels. The addition of color was implemented with minimal effort, which shows how flexible the original Game Boy architecture was. Let's take a closer look at the graphics unit known as the PPU. We mentioned earlier that the Game Boy Color's resolution is 160 pixels wide by 144 vertically, but this time instead of only 4 colors, the Game Boy Color can utilize up to 56 colors on screen at once from a palette of 32,000. And there's also some tricks to display many more colors, but more on that later. To compensate for the extra bits in memory required to store color values, the video RAM has been upgraded from 8 kilobytes on the original Game Boy to 16 kilobytes on the Game Boy Color. But this space is actually two switchable video RAM banks. Both are 8 kilobytes. This is used for backward compatibility reasons. Original Game Boy games would use Bank Zero exclusively, whereas Game Boy Color games would utilize both banks as necessary. Just like the Game Boy, there is no frame buffer in the Game Boy Color. This is to conserve RAM. All backgrounds are assembled utilizing tiles, which are 8x8 pixel squares. The screen viewport displays only a portion of the entire background map, but the Game Boy Color can store up to 1024 tiles across both of its VRAM banks, as compared to 512 tiles of the Game Boy. 
The Game Boy Color makes use of the exact same scrolling registers found in the Game Boy known as SCX and SCY. These registers can be adjusted in order to simulate scrolling. For example, in the Donkey Kong Country intro. During gameplay, clever use of loading in tiles before they are displayed on the viewport is something that many side-scrolling games utilize. If the viewport hits the end of the background map, it just wraps around. Other games such as Link's Awakening keep a portion of the off-screen tiles in memory for fast transitions into the next screen. The Game Boy Color uses the same three layers of display that the Game Boy does. They are backgrounds, windows and sprites. For the background layer on the Game Boy Color, there can be a total of eight color palettes used for the background tile sets. Each palette can use four colors compared to the Game Boy, where the background layer only has one palette. If we take a look at the individual tiles, they themselves appear to be quite limited in color, but when you combine all eight palettes, you can really start to see how the Game Boy Color takes full advantage of the hardware. The middle layer, or window layer, is used for the static display and is non-transparent. Then above that sits the sprite layer. Like the Game Boy, the Game Boy Color sprites are 8x8 pixels or 8x16 and supports a total of 40 sprites with a limitation of 10 sprites per line. However, there can be a total of 8 color palettes assigned to the sprites themselves. So we have 8 background palettes and 8 sprite palettes with 4 colors each. We said that there was a maximum of 56 colors on screen at once, but simple math tells us that this is a possible 64 colors in total. The limitation is that for sprites, there is always at least one transparent color per palette, which is never drawn. So subtracting eight colors leaves us with 56. It's worth mentioning that the Game Boy Color shares 99% of the same registers as the Game Boy itself, but with some additions. When we covered the Game Boy's graphics previously, we talked about how the Game Boy's display is drawn scanline by scanline vertically down the screen. The time taken between one scanline and the next is known as H blank or horizontal blank. When all 144 scanlines have been drawn, the scanline moves back to position zero. This is known as V blank or vertical blank. Just like the Game Boy, the Game Boy Color contains a specific register known as LYC that can trigger a mid-frame interrupt if it's equal to the current scanline position. During this interrupt, you can do things like adjust the SCX and SCY scroll registers to produce demo style or parallax scrolling effects like the one that we see here. You can even switch the color palette. In this driving game, both the road scrolling and the color palette has been adjusted mid-frame. This is one of the most powerful features of the Game Boy that Nintendo designed specifically for this feature and of course it carries over to the Game Boy Color. So everything we've talked about so far can be done across both the original Game Boy and the Game Boy Color. As mentioned, the registers are shared across both. So they're very, very similar as far as what you can do on both systems. But the Game Boy Color has some extra features that the Game Boy original does not. And we're going to take a look at some of the cool tricks and techniques that developers utilized in order to really extract the best out of the Game Boy Color. With 56 colors on screen, it's now possible to really show off the hardware with some stunning effects. Remember, this is all running on an eight megahertz processor with only a small amount of RAM, but the results can be superb. Since it's possible to switch palettes mid-frame, and with the Game Boy Color utilizing eight color palettes of four colors each, this allows for many colors to be displayed on screen at once. Technically, if we have 144 scan lines and we have eight background color palettes with four colors each, we can then have a maximum of 4,608 colors on screen. This is what's known as the so-called high color mode of the Game Boy Color that you may have heard about. This isn't technically its own screen mode, but something that can be done with some clever programming. If you look at this game known as Crystallis, the title screen uses this high color mode. If you look at the color palettes on an emulator, you can't see the red defined, but it's in the display. This is because it's being swapped out mid frame with another color. Another game, Cannon Fodder on the Game Boy Color, contains a FMV intro. This utilizes the high color palette swapping trick to really show off what the hardware can do. 
Because the color palettes are swap per scan line interrupt, these screens are best for static images and not really used in gameplay, although some games such as Alone in the Dark utilize more colors on screen in the background. High color mode uses more CPU cycles, therefore less cycles for other things such as game logic. Because of the increasing color palettes, Nintendo provided a faster method to move data into VRAM independent of the CPU. On the original Game Boy, this process is known as DMA, or direct memory access. DMA would occur during VBlank or when 144 scan lines were drawn and the time to go back to scan line zero. The Game Boy Color uses what's known as HDMA or horizontal blank DMA. 16 bytes of data are copied at each horizontal blank between scan lines, but can also do general DMA to stay compatible with the original Game Boy. And of course, double the CPU performance over the original Game Boy is a huge bonus, allowing for more advanced and complex games to run that would just not be possible on the original Game Boy. Wacky Races is one that comes to mind, displaying a Mode 7 style track with sprites. There is no Mode 7 hardware in the Game Boy Color as such, but this effect can be replicated thanks to clever palette swapping and mid-frame scroll register adjustments. You'll note that many driving games on the Game Boy Color utilizes a similar type of effect. Have you ever wondered how Game Boy Color games assign color palettes to monochrome Game Boy games? The answer lies in the hardware. When you turn on the Game Boy Color, the Bootstrap ROM runs. This boot ROM, amongst other things, performs a checksum calculation to determine if the cartridge that was inserted is original. The boot ROM contains a master list of 45 different palette configurations that it can apply to 174 Game Boy games. When a Game Boy game is inserted, its hash is matched against the list, and if it finds a match, it uses the palette that has been defined. For example, if we look up Super Mario Land 2, six gold coins in our list, this is the default palette configuration that it uses. While it doesn't give you any additional colors, it does add some life into the older games, and it's a cool feature. In the end, the Game Boy Color represented an important update to the aging Game Boy hardware, one that could have easily been disregarded as a non-essential upgrade, but Nintendo added new life to the handheld just by adding some color, but keeping most of the things the same. After all, why change what isn't broken? So there you have it guys, that is the Game Boy Color graphics system. It's a fascinating topic. It's not really that different from the original Game Boy, but some of these value adds just propel the Game Boy kind of to the next level. But Nintendo was very clever and did not lose sight of what made the Game Boy hardware so, so awesome and so compelling for so many people. They did not want to just cram all this new hardware into the system and completely change the architecture and what made it so great. They just tweaked it and added some minute details, added some color, and really essentially kept everything else the way it was. But just with that addition of color, really brought out so much more on the hardware. And you can see with some of the games that we demonstrated in this video that it really just kind of propelled the system to the next level. Well guys, we're going to leave it here for this video. Thank you so much for watching. If you liked it, you know what to do. Leave me a thumbs up and as always, don't forget to like and subscribe and I'll catch you guys in the next video. Bye for now.